So today we are going to start lecture 36 on sequential linear programming and I am Dr. Ranjan Ganguly. Now sequential programming or sequential linear programming is probably the simplest extension we have to linear programming and it's a concept which comes very naturally. So if you are going to solve a nonlinear constraint optimization problem, why not linearize this problem at a given point x of k and then solve the linear subproblem as a linear program? So we now know that linear programming is a very well-developed field and there are a plethora of methods as well as computer programs out there which solve the linear programming problem. So this looks like a very straightforward and simple way to handle nonlinear constraint problems. And therefore, we are going to study this in this particular video lecture. Now, of course, you need to use this concept sequentially because if you are dealing with a nonlinear function, if you linearize this function at a point x, k, you are going to get a problem which is a rough guess of the actual nonlinear problem. So if you solve this problem, you're going to get a solution, but the solution is not going to be the actual solution of the nonlinear constraint optimization problem. But you can use this particular solution as the next point, xk plus one, and you can once again linearize around this new point and keep doing this till you get a pretty good solution for the nonlinear constraint optimization problem. Now, in fact, why sequential linear programming is important because there are many constraint optimization methods which seek to create a sub problem, which is a kind of approximation of the actual nonlinear programming problem. Now, this sub problem could be linear or it could be quadratic. We will later see that a quadratic function or a quadratic problem is a good guess for a real nonlinear problem. But as a first stage, we can even think of a linear problem as a good guess for a mildly nonlinear problem. So the main task is that you need to create these sub problems at each point k. Now, if we develop a linear sub problem, then we would be using linear Taylor series expansions of the cost and constraint function. And therefore, this kind of linear approximation is going to be valid only very near the point xk. And then we are going to work around that small region and try to find the minimum point at that region and then move beyond from that region. So that's the basic philosophy behind sequential linear programming. So let us do this particular Taylor series approximation. So let's start with the cost function itself. So we take the function f of x and we take a Taylor series and retain only the first term. So you recall that you would have the function value at xk, you would have the gradient of the function at xk, and you would have the delta xk, which is the move in the design space. So essentially you are at a given point xk and you want to move this delta xk value in the design space to get to the new point. So we form this Taylor series for the function f, we form one more Taylor series for the function h, and we form one more Taylor series for the function g. So again, in the case of h and g, you are going to have one to p number of equations, and you are going to have one to m number of expressions here. So again, once you have done all this, then we would have a linear set of problems. And what we are going to do is we are trying to define, we are going to define some nomenclature so that we can write this whole thing in a simpler form. So we don't have to carry this delta x and so on. So we are going to define delta x as d, and we are also going to define these gradient values, and we are going to define these particular values at the point x, k for f, h, and g. So we have 
seen that there are three key gradients here, the gradient of the cost function, the gradient of the h function, and the gradient of the g function, which we have obtained from the given problem. So now we define some of this compact notation. So for example, we define fk is fx k. We define ej is negative hj xk, bj is negative gj xk, and we define the components of the gradient vector as well as the components of the matrices which contain the gradients of h and g. So this of course we are familiar with from our previous study in terms of the vector c which contains the gradient of the cost function. These are new in terms of gradient of the h functions and the gradient of the g functions. Now here these are actually matrices because you would have a value nij which would be dou hj by dou xi and similarly aij would be dou gj by dou xi and linearization is done at the design point k. Again since we know we are doing all this at, sub, at the point k we drop this superscript k. So we are carrying out all these k throughout. We'll just drop that. So we will simply say that d i is delta x i k. So once we have done all this notation, we can write this linearized problem in a much nicer form. So the problem becomes minimize this function f bar is ctd subject to ntd equal e and atd is less than equal to b where f bar is an approximate objective function because it is linearized it is ctd where c would be the gradient vector for the function at the given point and d of course would be the search direction we are trying to find. Similarly, we would get these two expressions here. Now, n is an n by p matrix whose columns contain the gradients of the h constraints. A is an n by m matrix whose columns are the gradients of the g of x constraint. And so this nj and aj are basically derivatives and so we can calculate them as part of the solution process and if we have taken all this derivative information we have got this linearized sub problem and now we are going to try to solve this linearized sub problem so this linearized sub problem is minimize this function subject to these two constraints and we clearly see here that because we have taken the linearized taylor series expansion the objective function and the constraints are linear in terms of design variable d. We can use linear programming to solve this problem. Now, if these coefficients here e and b are greater than zero, we can use the standard simplex method. Of course, if you have greater than type of constraints here, then you can use the two-phase simplex method, define the avs and so on. But anyway, since this is a linear program, you know how to solve this problem either by yourself or by taking recourse to the numerous software packages which are out there in linear programming. Now remember that this linear Taylor series of a nonlinear function is only going to be valid in a small neighborhood of xk. And this is where the problems of sequential linear programming start coming in because this particular linear sub problem which we have developed may work only in the small neighborhood of the point xk. That is why the concept of move limits becomes very important in sequential linear programming. And essentially we put move limits on this design variable di, which is basically the level of movement we have permitted this problem in the design space. So these move limits are used to restrict the design space. So for example, if we have di, we say this should be greater than some value here and it should be less than some value here. So that's a typical move limit which is put on this kind of design variable. Now this is put for all the k's one to n variables here. 
Now, the move limits typically can be selected as a fraction of the current design point. So you may move by 1% to 100% depending on the level of confidence you have in your linear Taylor series expansion. Now, typically you can understand from mathematics and calculus that because you have used a linear expansion and if your function is not too nonlinear, then you need to take small move limits. If your function is very nonlinear, this method is probably going to be problematic. So let us presume that your function is mildly nonlinear and then taking small move limits may help you to actually converge to a solution using this particular method. So we also recall that the next point is going to be xk plus one is xk plus d. Remember that d is delta xk, so therefore it is the movement you make in the search direction. So essentially you are using the sequential linear program to move in the design space. And also this variable di can be positive or negative. So again, based on the theory of linear programming, we have to split it into two different variables, both of which are positive. And then we can solve this problem. Now, some of the stopping criteria which can be used for the sequential linear programming are as follows. Number one is that all your constraints must be satisfied. So your G constraints must be less than some small number. Your H constraints must be less than small number. And here, of course, you have to put some modulus here because the value of H can be both negative and positive. Now change in design should also become very small. So typically what would happen is that after some time, the amount of change in the D value will become very small. And again, you can choose a small number here and restrict the norm of this D to below that particular number. This number could be 10 to the power minus four or 10 to the power minus eight, for example. So let us now write down this method in terms of a pseudo code which you can use to program. So we start with the starting design. So of course that is required in all these type of methods. So the starting design is x0. This is k0. Select two small numbers. Find the cost and constraint functions at point xk. Calculate the function value at this point and also the b and e values. Now calculate the gradients at xk. So for the cost function, you get c, and for the constraints h and g, you are going to get n and a matrices. Now you select the move limits on this particular value to move in the design space. So this is a lower limit, this is a higher limit, and you can select these. Now you define the LP subproblem. You solve for d of k check for convergence. So the check for convergence is simply that your constraints must be satisfied and also your design has more or less converged. So you are no longer moving in the design space. If this has happened, you can stop, else you continue the process, you go to a new design and so on. Now, the trick in sequential linear programming is to progressively relax the move limits as you go through the process. So when you start with the low value of K, your move limits are pretty tight. And then as you are becoming more and more confident of the progress of your method, you start relaxing the move limits. And if you are able to do this well, then you will converge with this particular method. So sequential linear programming was actually developed by Griffith and Stewart in 1961. It's popular in the oil and the chemical fields. If the optimal point lies at the vertex of the linearized feasible region, then rapid convergence is possible. And this you can understand from our previous study of linear programming. Now, this method is suitable for highly constrained nonlinear optimization problems where you have numerous linearly independent active constraints. And if you have a particular problem which defines some of these things or which satisfies some of these conditions, then you may do well with this method. So one of the important practical problems of this type are found in refinery model problems, and that's where this method is quite frequently used. Now, 
you can imagine that many people or researchers have tried to improve the method from what we have given here. So what we have given here is a very basic outline of this method. Now, one of the reasons to improve this method is that the linear programming solvers are very popular and widespread, and therefore you can use these linear programming solvers in this particular method. So you would just have to do this linearization. Now, some people have suggested that you can use a penalty function to actively guide the search direction. So we have discussed some such penalty functions before. There is also this method of centers, which basically requires you to fit the largest circle in this linearized design space and use the center of this circle to guide the design. This was proposed by some researchers some time ago. You also could combine, combine the sequential linear programming approach with the trust region method. And trust region method basically tries to define a region around your point xk, which you can trust in the sense that where the approximation which you have developed is valid. And so if you are able to trust in the nearby region of xk that your linear approximation is valid, then you can be in this particular region and move step by step in a sequential manner towards the actual solution. So that would make a lot of sense is to combine this kind of method with the trust region method and that has been proposed by some researchers. I think we are going to discuss trust region methods in a later lecture. So this was a background on sequential linear programming and it helps you understand that the simplest concept to tackle constraint optimization would be to develop a sequence of problems and then handle those problems and then converge toward a solution. So this is a very typical process which is often used in numerical methods when they are applied to nonlinear problems that you develop a linear approximation of that nonlinear problem or what is much better is a quadratic approximation for such nonlinear problem and then solve this problem in a sequential manner. So in fact, in the next lecture or so, we are going to discuss the approach of quadratic programming and then we are going to go into sequential quadratic programming and the constraint steepest descent method as some of the more powerful methods for constraint optimization. So you can see all these methods are building up and you are getting the feel for this particular problem. So I'll see you in my next video.